We sent out an email to remind you. How many of you prayed the 23rd Psalm every day this week? Some of you, just very few of you. Alan challenged us last week to do that. And um, I, I really do believe that when there's a pastoral challenge, there's a reason for it. And so if you didn't do that last week or you forgot, start this week. It's never too late. And so start this week and um, pray it every day. And I believe that God wants to reveal some things to us. See, I don't think, Alan doesn't usually issue challenges like that. I think for him to do that, there's something in it. And he said when he just started, God told him to do it, so he just did it. And there was just, he just recited it and prayed it. But as the week went on, God began to reveal more and more to him. And so I think God does have something to say to us individually and corporately. And so please start doing that this week. Pray it every day this week and see what God might want to say to you. Um, before, a few weeks before Alan preached last Sunday, he uh, said that God was speaking to him about the shepherd and the 23rd Psalm. And I've taught that message for many years. It's one of my favorite things that I've taught. And he goes, send me your notes. And so I sent him my notes. And as he preached last week, he did not use one sentence, not one sentence out of my notes, not one sentence. And, and at the end, I was thinking, ooh, Ezekiel 34 would be just a beautiful ending to this. And then Alan ended with Ezekiel 34. And, and, but he didn't preach one sentence out of my notes. And so I go, I think I'm going to go ahead and preach the 23rd Psalm next week. And so today I'm going to preach my notes that he didn't touch on. He gave us many other things. He talked about how trust is built in drops and lost in buckets. Am I saying it right, Alan? He, he talked about four things that, that sheep need. Uh, there's a lot of, of richness in that. I went back and listened to it again, and I realized that a lot of what he said I didn't even catch the first time. And so go on the podcast, go to Facebook, do the videos. I think you can sign up on YouTube and the videos will come to your phone. Is that how it works, Dan? And um, so that you can re-listen to some of these sermons because there's a lot in them. But today, I'm going to teach something, the 23rd Psalm, that I've been teaching since 1980. 1980 is the first time I taught this psalm. Some of you were not born. Some of you were little kids. Uh, a few of you were around. And... Um, I have notes from all different years that I've taught it. So today I sort of jumbled up the notes, and I have some of the old and some of the new, and, um, and we'll, just, we'll just see where, where we go. But the Word of God since 1980 has not changed. It, it hasn't changed. But people have. Patterns of thinking in people are very different now than they were in 1980 or in 1996. Uh, you know, there was a time when... Um, Generation Jesus did outreaches here in the area, and the newspapers came and covered our meetings. You won't find that today <laughs> in this area. It's a different mentality. People have changed. Uh, people are less trusting. They are more stressed. They are more fearful and cynical. Uh, they rely a lot more on human reasoning than they did maybe in 1980 or 1996. Uh, People are not always as solid, and they're easily moved, easily moved. Uh, a new cultural thing comes out, and people just fall for it, and people just go in that direction. I, I, I begin reading, will they take us off YouTube for this? More and more young kids, 8 years old, 10 years old, now you're coming out as transgender. This didn't used to happen. This is bizarre. There is a spirit that is ministering to the minds of our kids that is enticing them into a thought pattern that is not God's. And there's a lot of deception going on, and there's not truth. But the Word of God is the same, and it lasts forever. And so it's harder now sometimes to renew the mind because the mind is being bombarded 24-7 with words, with pictures, with knowledge, with information, with entertainment, with communication. And the, there's so many voices, but the voice that we hear the most is the one that shapes us and forms us. And just like Alan said, we're wanting God to speak, but are we listening for his voice? Are we getting away and getting quiet and going, okay, God, what do you want to say to me? And not expecting him to yell it through our busy day. So I'm going to take this passage of scripture, the 23rd Psalm, it consists of 118 words. That's all. 118 words. But I believe that it can help to change your thought patterns. If you would saturate your mind with it, a new way of thinking would actually be the result. 118 words. Uh, my scripture that I love in John 2, 5 is just five words. Whatever he says, do it. Whatever he says, do it. Five words can change your life. 
but certainly 118 can. And you could memorize these 118 words, and probably some of you could recite it without even looking in the book. But its power is not in memorizing the words. Its power is in thinking the right thoughts that it's trying to bring you into. And so until you think right thoughts about God, about his character, his nature, his love, about his unfailing care for you, the devil can lie to you, and you will fall for his lies. And so no matter how many sermons we preach or prayers we pray, there has to be a renewing of your mind to even be able to receive the things that are being said. Now, to a great extent, the Bible is a collection of books, of writings by men who wrote under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But much of its terminology and much of its teaching deals with outdoor subjects. Think about that. Natural things, things in nature. The, the early readers led an outdoorsy life. I didn't. 1976, this 24-year-old newly born again young woman who was born into a house that had air conditioning, a garbage disposal, never been on a farm, didn't know what cotton or wheat out in a field looked like. I mean, cotton balls that you cleanse your face with or maybe Wheaties in a box. But I didn't know, like, Easy had pictures of all that. He grew up on a farm, a very rural upbringing, but I didn't have that. So when I started reading the Bible, I began to realize that I could miss a lot of the truth that was being spoken about because I didn't understand sheep or wheat or soil or grapes. And I didn't, I mean, grape, I just, which one at the store do I pick? How, how much is it per pound? That's what I knew about grapes. And so I realized that there was a lot of stuff that Jesus talked about, and he used natural things to impart supernatural truth. And so for me to gain an understanding of those things so I wouldn't miss the supernatural application, I had to study. And so let's take one verse of Scripture to start with. Psalm 100, 3. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Doesn't that just sound nice, like I'm a cuddly little lamb, and I'm all white and furry, and I'm his little pet sheep, and, uh, you know, and that's the religious thought, and, um, you know, I'm just so darling, and everything I do is cute. Um, my little niece sent me a picture. She moved on to some acreage in Tennessee, and um, she took a picture of uh, the field, and there was this little white, cuddly, uh, furry creature out there, and I go, oh, y'all have little, y'all have little lambs. No, it was her little dog. It was the the, the relative of, <laughs> and she goes, that's our dog. And I go, oh, okay, I'm not good at this. And um, <laughs> and so we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And we think we might have our little thoughts about sheep, but really, if you study sheep, I taught this in leadership training. I'll go over it quickly. No other livestock requires as much attention as sheep. That's a real fact. They can't take care of themselves. Number two, left alone, sheep will follow the same trails until those trails become ruts. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Sheep has, have no sense of direction. Cammie has this impeccable sense of direction. So does Easy. Alan and I don't know north, south, east, or west. You have to say, turn at the Walmart and then take a left here, and then you're going to see a bank. And when the bank is, take a right there. And, and Easy will go, are you going east? I go, I don't know east. Like, how do you know east? I mean, and sheep are like that. They have no sense of direction. You know that if a dog or a cat or a horse is lost, they can find their way back, but not a sheep. A sheep will become so occupied in following its own eating path that it will become separated from the flock and get lost easily. Sheep have poor vision. They can only see about a maximum of 10 to 15 yards. They cannot see very far at all. Sheep are poor swimmers. They have a heavy coat of wool. Uh, the wool symbolizes self-life in the Bible, the self uh, or the flesh. Sheep are basically timid. They're easily prone to fear, and they will gnaw and chew at one another, causing patches on another sheep to be exposed uh, to harmful elements, much like backbiting. So there are some facts about sheep. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. So if we focus on people today, we could easily get discouraged and depressed. <laughs> and so we won't, and we will look at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and talk about what Alan talked about, which is the shepherd's call. 
See, the shepherd's call. We are in a flock and we're with a bunch of people, but we have a shepherd. We are not out here helpless and alone. We have a shepherd and he is called the good shepherd. And sometimes we don't realize how good he is because our mind is programmed because of other things. And so we, we characterize him in ways that do not reflect him properly. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. The shepherd king of Israel, David, Alan said at the end of his life, wrote the psalm. Not when he was a young man, but at the end of his life. Because it's one thing to start strong, but it's another to finish. And I know people who are like shooting stars, but then they're gone. Where are they? Where they go? Oop, they fell, and they took a bunch of people with them. See, it's about staying the course over a long period of time. David, the king of Israel, said the Lord was his shepherd. So even if you're a king, you need a shepherd. See, even if you're a king, you need to look at somebody. somebody you need to yield to someone above you. And so the real question is, is he your shepherd? Alan said, is your job your shepherd? Is your money your shepherd? Is your spouse your shepherd? Are your circumstances your shepherd? See, what's leading you? Is he yours? Have you surrendered control to him? When I started hearing the Bible, I was in my 20s, and I had a strong constitution. If I'd set my mind to get something done, my dad said, if she's deciding she's going to do something, she'll get it done. That can be good. That can be bad. Your strength can always be your weakness. And so before I asked Jesus into my heart, I had to think a long time because I heard that prayer those people were saying, and they said, I give you control of my life, and I didn't know if I wanted to give up control. But I thought about it, and I prayed about it, and I listened to the word that was being taught, and I thought, I, I, either I'm going to submit to truth or I'm going to reject truth. And so then it occurred to me I hadn't done that great of a job being in control. <laughs> and so maybe I did need to give control of my life away. And so I asked Jesus into my heart, and I was born again, and I totally submitted to him as we do when we come to him. But you know, after a few years, we can subconsciously take a few areas back. We give him control, but now in this area, Lord, I, I, I'm going to take it back. You know, because I, I, you, you've been sort of slow, and you haven't done enough, and I want to go this direction, and you haven't said I could go this direction, and I want to go here, and so I'm just going to do it. And then another friend of mine called me one time after she heard me teach this lesson, and she goes, the Lord gave me a picture about the 23rd Psalm, and I was all excited. And she goes, he showed me I was a sheep, and I just dug my heels in. And he was trying to get me to go, but I just dug my heels in, and he wasn't moving me. And so, see, we can get to the point where we want to move ahead or we don't want to move. And yet we said, Lord, you're in control. But little by little, that pro process of relinquishment, we have taken it back. And see, we don't give God control because he's a control freak. We don't give him control because he needs it. We give him control because we need it. We need it. And so you can keep your rights to yourself. You can do that. But just remember, you can't see very far. You get lost easily. <laughs> you have trouble swimming if water's above your head. And other sheep will try to gnaw you to death. So go ahead. Keep control if you want to. But, but I think I'm better off to go, God, you be in control. The Lord is my shepherd. And so then it says, I shall not want. I shall not want. When Alan said, I know a lot of us want many things. I saw a few people roll their eyes thinking of all the stuff they want. <laughs> Do you know that after World War II, the Allies gathered up huge numbers of hungry, homeless children and they placed them in large camps to be fed and cared for. But they discovered that the children were not sleeping at nights. They were fearful and they were restless. And a psychologist was brought in and hit on a solution. When the children went to bed, they were each given a slice of bread to hold. If they wanted more to eat, they could have it. But this particular slice was not to eat, it was just to hold. And the results were amazing. Children would sleep well and be rested subconsciously, knowing that the next day they were not going to starve, knowing that the next day their needs would be met, knowing that the next day they had something for themselves. And see, some of, this, some of us maybe are like the children. Like, God, are you going to be there for me tomorrow? Are you really going to do it? Are you going to take, is that bill going to get paid? Are you going to heal me? That, that healing that you paid for, am I going to be able to receive it? The Lord wants us to rest knowing that the shepherd has made plans for our needs tomorrow. He knows what you need before you even ask. 
before you even ask. You know, we've got a lot going on right now. And so my house, which requires a lot of maintenance because we have a lot of wood and a flat roof and a pool, and, and it just, I felt like it was in disrepair. And I'm very orderly and I keep everything just so-so. Y'all have seen my 15, 16-year-old car that looks like it's brand new. And there's a certain man that does an amazing job of, of keeping up things around our house, the painting and the, any wood that needs to be replaced, but he's not been available for a year and a half. And I told Alan the other day, I said, if I could just get Ben for two or three days, it would make such a difference, but he's just not available. Four days ago, Ben called and said, I can come for two or three days right now if you need anything done. I'm like, he knows what we need before we, I didn't even ask. I just said, if only. And so even in the midst of trying times, God will bring in things to bring some ease. God will bring in what you need. There are little things. Uh, that Alan called yesterday morning. Do you need anything? I go, yes, if you could take easy so-and-so at 4 o'clock. I have this going on. That would really, you know, God will come in little ways. Don't, don't overlook the fact that he is providing for you. Maybe some big things you're still waiting on, but even the little things can gnaw at your feet and get at you in the meantime. And God is saying, I'm here. I know what you need. I'm going to take care of it. You can relax. You can rest. Things are going to be okay. There's a pastor friend of ours. He's, he's in heaven now. Uh, he told this story at a meeting after Easy and I first met, and we were both at a meeting where he talked about this. His name was Jimmy Hester. Uh, he tells a story of a little girl who was going to be in a church program. And around her house, she would just rattle off the words of the 23rd Psalm, and she could do it perfectly, and her mom was there cheering her on. And so there, a day came for the program, though, to be performed on stage. And when she got up there, it was a little different. And she looked around, and there's all the people, and there's a microphone. And um, she, she got a little nervous, and she swallowed. And she goes, the Lord? And the faces of the people just seemed overwhelming to her. And she goes, okay, okay I'm going to start again. And her mom was in the wings going, come on, you can do it. And she goes, the, the Lord is my... And mom goes, come on, darling, you can do it. You can do it. And she goes, the Lord is my shepherd. And she gave it one final try. The Lord is my shepherd and he's all I want. And that's the truth. The first thing God ever said to me was, I am all that you need. See, if he's all that I need, he ought to be all that I want. See, I just need more of you, God. I need more of you. Lord, I'm stressed. I'm, I'm, I'm hurting. I'm worried. Lord, I need more of you. See, sometimes we think if he just answers our prayer, we're going to be okay. And there was actually a time back in the, was it the 80s? And I said, God, if you would just do this, this, and this, I could relax. And he specifically said, I want you to be able to rest before I do this, this, and this. And you know what? When I, because he wanted to teach me a greater lesson that this, this, and this wasn't going to change my life. But if I could rest in him, it would change my life. And so he didn't even, if, if the answer to your prayer is your criteria to be okay, you're never going to be okay. Because there's always going to be a prayer you need answered. But there's always a time you must learn to rest in him. And so he taught me that lesson well. And so I readjusted. I made the course correction. I made the little gentle shift that he was asking for. And all those prayers got answered. The most valuable of all was that I could learn to depend on him. The Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. <laughs> so the little girl might have had the words wrong, but boy, she was right. <laughs> When your world is tumbling down around you, when you're sick, when you're lonely, when you're hurting, when it doesn't seem like you have anyone to turn to, it's a good time to say, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. After the men did all the work at my house, it was quite a mess. So I'm outside when Alan comes to pick up Easy to bring him to his haircut, and I'm sweeping up the mess, and Alan drives up, and I go, the Lord is my shepherd. He's all I want. <laughs> While I'm sweeping uh, shavings into, into a trash can. <laughs> Then the Bible says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. In the heat of the noonday sun, a shepherd knows that if the sheep starts drinking water with his stomach filled with undigested grass, he will get sick. So he makes the sheep lie down and rest. Now, God doesn't make us do anything. He's given us a free will. But he does say, and I think we had this scripture in flow a few weeks ago, Psalm 46.10, be still, be still. Didn't you sing it, Court? And know that I am God. Be still, be still. We don't live in a world that has a great tendency towards stillness anymore. 
Things are going fast. Be still and know that I am God. So every great person that you read about that ever contributed anything really worthwhile to society will tell you that first they, they drew apart from the hustle and the bustle of life, and there was some rest and reflection. And in that time, many of those ideas were made, many of those inventions were formed, many of those books were, the ideas were given. And so sometimes if we're too busy, even doing good things, witnessing, preaching, working, running to meetings, doing good deeds, if we don't have time for God, we're working for God without God. <laughs> My sheep, John 10, 27, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus himself drew apart. Now, the green pastures in the verse make me to lie down in green pastures. David wasn't just being poetic. There were not many green pastures in the Holy Land. And so when they came to some good green pasture land, the sheep would want to nibble and nibble and nibble and nibble and eat and eat and eat and stay there because they knew there might not be another one for a while. But really, the, the application here is God is saying, look, I'm not going to run out of spiritual food for you. I will get you to the next green pasture. See, if right now this is a green pasture, fine, but you need to walk through another direction, that's okay. Don't be afraid. There's going to be another green My blessings haven't run out. Uh, you know, some people think, oh, I, I need to go to this place and my prayer can get answered. No, God can answer your prayer no matter where you are. He can bring the green pasture to you. And so... God's not running out of blessings because he is the good shepherd, and he will provide for all our needs. The next verse, he leads me beside still waters. If we're the religious Pollyanna in us wants to go, he's just going to make everything still and peaceful around me, and everything, still waters are just going to be all around me. That's not what this means at all. Sheep are timid creatures. They are poor swimmers because of their heavy coat of wool. They can drown easily in water. A shepherd will tell you that a sheep will not drink from a flowing stream. They will only drink from still water. The sheep will not drink until they can see their reflection in the water. The only water we can see a reflection that we want to be like is when we look in the word of God. So we need to have still water so that we can be transformed into the image of God. We can't be drinking from the muddy, polluted water of the world. We can't be drinking from the movies that the world is showing. We can't be drinking from the books that the world is publishing. We can't be drinking from the philosophies that the world is trying to sell you in every single commercial. I cannot watch a commercial nowadays without two men kissing. I cannot watch a commercial today without something being advertised that's perverse and evil. And so the world is selling, selling, selling. Don't you buy it. Don't you buy it. You need to see the reflection of Jesus in what you're partaking. Now, he restores my soul. He restores my soul. I have a whole series, eight services on restoring damaged emotions, war on soul trouble, it's called. Uh, inner healing, emotional healing. And at the beginning, I was listening because I just assigned him to someone, and it says, you know, our name is called the Shepherd's Church. And I'm like, whoa, if anybody listens to him, they'll think, who is this person? The name of this church, when we started it, was the Shepherd's Church. And you might be here and not know that. We changed the name to the Epicenter in about, what, 2001 or two, somewhere in there? Nobody could spell shepherd. We were always having to spell shepherd for them, and it just drove me crazy. Now no one can spell epicenter, like we moved from the frying pan into the fire. And so they'll epicenter with the capital. No, it's one word. And, and they couldn't spell shepherd. They can't spell epicenter. But for years, I ministered under the name Shepherd Ministries when I went and taught Bible studies and spoke at women's conferences and things because our heart was to do what Alan talked about in, in Ezekiel 34, bring back what's lost restore what's broken, bind up what's, what's hurt. And so that is a true shepherd's work. And so God says here, he restores my soul about the 23rd Psalm. The sheep are out in a herd all day long and we need one another. I thank God for the body of Christ. I don't know how people stay okay that don't go to church as Christians. I mean, in China, they'll, they'll risk their life to, to come together. In, in, in the United States, church is everywhere and people want to stay home and watch TV. But sheep are out in a herd all day. But at some time during the day, the shepherd will give individual care and attention to each sheep. 
when I'm hurt, when, when I get the props knocked out from under me, see, only God can breathe that fresh life on the inside of me. Only God can fill me up. Only he can really restore me, restore, bring back to how it was originally intended to be. In, in life, we go through things that mess with us, that harm us, that, that, that abuse that people go through, even unkind words that people hear over and over and over that, that da- you know, damage their soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. And God wants to restore our soul, restore our soul, bring it back to how he originally intended it to be before the damage was done. And so there's a restoration time. And so sometimes I have to quit running in the herd and get by myself. Another translation of this verse is he revives life in me. He restores my soul. He revives life on the inside of me. And so I can't run forever on a gallon of gas. You know, I I know that I've taught that before, but this week I go, God, I can't run forever on a gallon of gas. And he goes, but sometimes I can just make your gallon go further than you thought it could go. And so it works both ways. See, we don't dictate, and God will do things in a way we might not even expect. But if we know he is with us, and we know we can trust him, We are not afraid to keep going. God's mercies are new every morning. If you have to think way back to some testimony of something God did in your life, we need to think again. See, your last testimony shouldn't be 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 5 years ago or even 5 months ago. This week, I can name things that God did in my life. Notice Take note of, rehearse, speak what God is doing. Thank him for what he's doing. Lord, I thank you that Ben called. Lord, I thank you that Alan called me. I didn't, you know, there are little things that happen that God is doing for you. Your testimony shouldn't be way back when. There should be constant, fresh, new things happening in your life that the Lord is doing for you that you recognize. He can deliver you. He can save you. He can heal you. He can baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He's not short in any good thing. Now, the Christian life should be exciting because God is constantly saving people, healing them, blessing them, constantly doing something. And so you need to look for what God's doing and latch on to that instead of talking all about what the devil's doing. Was it Charles Capps who said something like, we can have what we say, but we're saying what we have? We can have what we say, but instead we're saying what we have. And so we need to reverse that. Now, immediately after that, the psalm says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Sheep have poor eyes. The Palestinian fields were covered with narrow paths over which sheep were led to pasture land. Now, some of the paths led to a precipice which the sheep could just fall right off to their death. A cliff, boom, they're gone. Some led to green pastures. Some led to still waters. But like paths in our lives, do we follow the path of our choosing or are we letting the Lord be in control? Our vision is poorer than his We can't see ahead. We don't know. It looks good, but when we get there, we don't know what else is lurking. Sometimes the shepherd led the sheep over steep and difficult places. See, somebody said, well, if it's hard, I know it's not God. I'm like, oh, wow. (laughs) It was hard finding this building. It was hard getting the money to build. It was a lot of things that are God are not easy. So sometimes you will go through difficult places to get to a place that's right for you to get to the place that's best for you. And so it says, lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. See, we don't get to these good places because we're so great. We don't get to these good places because of who we are. It's not by works of righteousness, but it's because of his mercy. He has done all this for you. We're saved by faith. We're kept by faith. We're healed by faith. But faith is even not of ourselves. It is what? A gift of God. And so it's because of him. It's because of him. Now, this is the verse that Alan sort of alluded to. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The funeral verse. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Contrary to what you might think, this is not talking about when you're going to die. First of all, a shadow is not the real you. If, if you see my shadow, that's not really me. A shadow is when it maybe it looks like you're going to die. It feels like you're going to die. It feels like your world is falling apart. The shadow of death. But it's not when you really die. A shadow is, is not the real thing. It's the potential when it feels that way. But yet, there's also a, a truth 
that in the Holy Land there is a real place near Bethlehem called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. So you got to study a little bit to know what's going on. And at its widest point, it is 12 feet wide. At its narrowest point, it's not even two feet wide. And so you can only travel one way. You can't get flocks going two different directions on a two feet wide stretch of land. And so the shepherds with sheep would travel up one way in the morning and pass down that way again in the evening. And there were many crevices and hiding places where thieves, wild animals, predators, serpents are lurking, just like Satan is always lurking. Satan is there trying to spring up when he might, when he may. He is always on the lookout to, 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 to do us damage. He hates the children of God. He is against us. He was against Jesus. He will be against you. But the good shepherd searches out those places. And he uses his rod and staff to prepare the way. The rod is not to beat you. The, not is, the rod is not an instrument of torture to correct you. The rod is to beat off the predators. The rod is actually an instrument of mercy to save you. And so then the staff with the crook on the end is to pull you back in when you get off track. And so the rod and the staff are both good for you. Neither one is a bad thing. And so David uh, killed a lion and a bear with his rod while protecting his sheep. It tells us in 1 Samuel 17. The rod's a heavy club. It's two or three feet long. The staff is about eight feet long. It has that crook at the end of it, like you see in all the children's plays. But when a sheep loses its footing or stumbles, sometimes off the side of a cliff, the shepherd can grab the staff around the middle and pull that sheep back up to safety. And many times, we don't know how close we are to making the most fatal mistake ever, and God uses his staff to pull us back. He gently takes it, just like Jen said this morning. It's powerful, but it's gentle. And he reaches down, and he places the crook over our chest, and he lifts us up back on path, and we're saved. How many times has Jesus done that for you? I can think of a lot that he's done it for me. I'm going to skip some of this and move on. The next verse says, Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Now, the mean girl version of that is, see, I'm going to be eaten, and they're just going to watch me, and I'm going to have all these delicacies, and those people that were ugly to me and criticized me and gossiped about me, they're not going to have anything. And that is nothing what this verse is about. <laughs> in the Holy Land pastures, <laughs> in the Holy Land pastures, there were several poisonous plants that were fatal to a sheep. They, there were uh, burrs that could penetrate the soft nose of a sheep and cause little sores. The shepherd would dig out these enemies on the table, the pasture land, uh, and, so, and destroy them so that the sheep could safely graze without these things getting all infected into their little bodies. So the pasture was like a prepared table for the sheep to eat at. There is enemies all around us. The world is full of corruption everywhere. Satan is at work in the hearts and lives of people. But because he is, Jesus is also working. He is also removing danger as much as he can from us so that we will not fall right into it and get hurt. Romans tells us where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. Sin is here. Corruption is in the world. Why do bad things happen? This is a fallen world. But where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. And 1 John says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So people might ridicule you for your trust in Jesus. They might look at your circumstances and say, why do you serve God if that's happening to you? Or they might say, listen to what the doctor says. There's no hope for you. But I will tell you, if God be for us, who can be against us? So we need to listen to what God is saying. Now, sometimes we don't know exactly what God is saying. And sometimes we have a word we can hold on to, and sometimes we don't. But we always can hold on to his word. See, if we don't have a prophetic word, we have a Bible word. And so we can hold on to his word. And so he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Sheep could cut their little head on sharp stones in the grass. They could get scratches from the briars and thorns. And at the end of the day, even though the norm was that sheep would, you know how we all sit in the same place here? Pretty much if I want to know if somebody's here, I'll look back to their area. Their area. I know that so-and-so always sits over here and so-and-so sits there. And I know that Naomi always sits on that row right, that, about, right about that place. I know that Kirk and Angie, they sit here. And so if I want to know if you're here, I'll just look to your area. Sheep are like that and we're like sheep. 
<laughs> because they have a definite order in their line when, they're, when the shepherd is taking them. To, they sort of stay in that little order all day long. They don't get out of order, just like us. But yet, even though we're in a flock, even though we're in a corporate body, there was always a time when the individual sheep could mosey on over, get out of their place in line, and go over to the shepherd. And if you watch in, in, in Israel, like if somebody was filming a shepherd and sheep, you would see that the shepherd would uh, bend over and sort of rub the nose of that little sheep, and then he'd scratch his ears, and he'd usually whisper something in his ear too. And this is when he'd anoint his head with oil because any place that there had been scratches or burrs, he'd just dip his hand in the oil and, and rub it over that, and then it would heal up quickly and it wouldn't get in infected. And his cup would run over. See, there was a, a cup that the, the shepherd would pour water. God's not going to give me a half-empty cup. He's going to make sure it runs over, that there is enough for me. So we have to get, get out of our mentality of lack and into our, our mentality of stewarding the abundance that God really has for us. My cup runs over. It's not half full. And so the Bible then says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Then I get to die. See, but I have a full life ahead of me before I die. It's the, the valley of the shadow of death is not when I die. It's when things are going wrong, but I'm alive. And, and I just need to trust God to work, through, work me through that. But then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I had a, somebody who told me they had two little dogs, and they named them Goodness and Mercy, so Goodness and Mercy could follow them everywhere they went. And we just need to remind ourselves, Goodness is following me. Mercy is following me. Lord, I just thank you for that. And so Philippians tells us to think on these things, what's right and pure and holy and true and lovely. And yet we, we tend to think on things that are depressing and frustrating and fearful. And, you know, and, and I'll catch myself doing that. I'll, nope, nope. Uh, push that thought out. Nope, nope. Goodness and mercy. Thank you, Lord. This is good. That's good. You've answered that prayer. You're, you're not this, you're, you haven't changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so then after I live a full life, where I've let the shepherd lead me and let him be in control and experience his goodness, and where I've seen other people all around me experience his goodness, then I can go to my real heavenly home and, and get a new address and dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But I want to close with a little story that I've told several times. Some of you have heard it before. I do not know the source of this story. I cannot remember when I first heard it. But the story goes like this. There was an old man and there was a young man on the same platform, and they were standing before a vast audience of people. They were having a special program, and as part of the program, each one was to repeat from memory the words of the 23rd Psalm, what we just talked about today. The young man, who was trained in the best speech techniques and in drama, gave in beautiful diction, like a silver-tongued orator, the words of the Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It was just, it was just, it just flowed off of his tongue like water. And when he finished, the audience clapped and applauded and cheered and asked him to return so that they might hear again his wonderful voice. But it was the old gentleman's turn. And he leaned heavily upon his cane. And he walked up to the front of the same platform. And in a feeble voice that was a bit shaky, he repeated the same words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And when he was seated, no sound came from the listeners. People seemed to be praying, and many were actually weeping at their chairs. In the silence, the young man got up, and he said, friends, I wish to make an explanation. You asked for me to come back and repeat the psalm, but yet you remained silent when my friend here was seated. The difference, I will tell you, I, I know the psalm, but he, he knows the shepherd. Stand to your feet with me. Thank you, Lord. If you're in this room and you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never committed to your life to Jesus and made him your shepherd, raise your hand and we will pray with you. If you're in this room and there are areas that you need to relinquish and give back to him where you've taken control, just raise your hand, and we will. that will be a symbol and a sign to him that 
right now you're giving, you're giving back every area of your life. You're not going to hold back anything. You're not going to pull back that one area where you're worried about and you think you can do better than he can because he is your shepherd. So, Father, you see these hands. And, Lord, all of us say to you, Lord, we don't want to just know words. We want to know your heart. We want to know you. We want a revelation, a fresh revelation of you. Alan preached on the shepherd's call. You are calling us closer to you. Lord, we ask that we would beckon, that we would, we would hear everything that you say, that we would hearken to your voice, God, that we wouldn't st stand back, we wouldn't dig our heels in the sand. God, that we would gently walk over to you and receive all that you have for us. So, God, I thank you. It's not just a matter of words. It's as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So, Lord, we ask that you renew our minds according to your word, not just that we can spout off words, but we get the heart behind the words and that we, we get closer to you, the person who inspired the words, the man who is our one and only, our all in all, the lion and the lamb, the, the, the shepherd, God, who leads all of us into green pastures, anoints our head with oil, make sure that our cup runs over, and make sure that we lack in no good thing. So, Lord, we love you. And so, Lord, let us get a greater glimpse of your heart, even through this psalm, as we pray it every day, as we don't just say it, but we pray it, and then we can hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.